use this, the title tonight, Don't Fight the Battle on the Devil's Terms. Oh, that'll preach. <laughs> Glory to God. How many of you got that? Okay. I just think, I just feel like saying that again. Don't fight the battle on the devil's terms. Now you say it. Tell, just turn to somebody and just, just tell them, don't fight the battle on the devil's terms. All right, let's get a running start at this. 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now look up here for just a second. Let me make this comment. Saul was the people's choice. David was God's choice. You know what? When we let God choose, we're going to have the right situations in our life. When we choose, we're limited to what we know and what we can see. But when God chooses, he is not limited. He sees the future just like you see the here and now. So he's not fooled by somebody that looks good for 30 days. He sees everything. And he not only sees the outside, he looks on the heart and he has the ability to cut right to the chase and know exactly what people are thinking. He knows whether they're going to change for the good or the bad. David was God's choice. Then we find in, in, uh, in verse 6, Samuel has come to, uh, to Bethlehem and he's finding out some things about the sons and he says, you guys come to the sacrifice with me. And in verse 6, it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And then next verse, watch this. God corrects something in the prophet Samuel. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. You know, a lot of people, that's exactly what they're doing in life. They're looking at somebody's countenance. Oh, he has a smile on his face. They're looking at somebody's size and they're saying, well, they're big. Maybe, maybe not physically big, but they're looking on their stature perhaps in the business realm. They're looking on their stature. Maybe they have, a, they have a, a swagger in their step. Maybe they have some confidence. And they're looking on the outside. They're looking on the mannerisms. They're looking at the fact that this person is good looking on the outside. God says, uh-uh-uh. You're looking at the wrong place. If you're impressed with the outside, wait till you see the inside. What's that people say about beauty is only skin deep but ugly? All the way to the bone. So Jesse, you know, he is, he is working this system. You know, he knows now that there's something going to happen in, in his family. So then he called. Abinadab, I like this. Here's the dad, he sees the anointing oil, he sees the horn, he's, he's saying something good's about to happen. You know, even Jesse knew something about the anointing. When the anointing oil came out, something good was going to happen. They already knew Samuel had come peaceably, but somebody's about to be anointed for something. That, in, that, 
that oil symbolic of the Holy Ghost and the, the anointing of God. He knew that when somebody was anointed, they were set aside for a particular task that God was calling them out, separating them from the rest of the group. And that an anointing oil was uh, not only symbolic of the Holy Spirit, it was also a sign to everybody else that that person was marked out somehow as special to God. So he calls, he calls Abinadab. You ever know anybody that their dad or mom called them, but God hadn't called them, but they were still trying to act called? Three of you. Let me tell you what, you better know what God has called you to do. You better know that it was God that called you and not some man or some woman that called you. So he calls Abinadab to pass before him and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. And so Jesse makes all of the sons pass by. And verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are here all thy children? And he said, there, Jesse, that is, said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, verse 13, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Now watch this. Something changed when the anointing of God came on him. Just like God honored the people's choice in Saul. Because the Scripture said when the anointing came on him, he was changed into another man. Let me tell you, God will change you. If you let the anointing come on you, it will change you. As a matter of fact, if you haven't changed, but you shout, but you dance, we're going to question what spirit you've been in. But, because when you yield to God and you give him more of you, you're going to act more like him. Come on, y'all, help me preach this tonight. So when the anointing came on him, the spirit of God came on him. Spirit of God, the anointing of God. It's tremendous. You know what? When Jesus had the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove, that was the start of the supernatural in his ministry. You say, wasn't he God before? Yes, he was God before. But you know what? He was doing things in a certain order because he was a pattern and an example for us to follow. That anointing came on him and he began to do miracles. That anointing came on him, and the Scripture then makes a point to tell us that he was led by the Spirit because he's laying down a pattern, an example for us. Then Jesus began to do miracles. Then Jesus began to say, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. So it was the beginning of the supernatural. And likewise in David, when the anointing came on him, the Spirit came on him, and when the Spirit came on him, supernatural things begin to take place. Let me tell you, the Scripture says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Within your physical body, within your vessel is housed the precious Holy Spirit, the anointing of God. That means that you're open. Once you've received the baptism in the Holy Ghost, you're, you have an opening, an entrance, if you will, into the supernatural things of God. You yield just like you yield yourself to speak in tongues. You can yield yourself to be used by God, to speak a word, to deliver a prophecy, to have a tongue and interpretation. You yield yourself and then the giftings of God, that administrative gift, that teaching gift. You yield to the Spirit of God who's not only come on you, but He's in you. And if you yield to Him, supernatural things are the result. Amen? Now, I like 1 Samuel chapter 16 because it makes this point. The anointing does not always go to the most qualified person. Are you listening to me? Samuel took the, ho the horn of oil and anointed him. Listen, it's the anointing of the Spirit of God that makes the difference. It's the anointing of the Spirit of God. Now, you know where we're going from here, don't you? 
Let me just say this. The story of David and Goliath is about the least in the kingdom taking on the greatest in the devil's kingdom. The least in God's kingdom with the anointing on him is greater than the greatest that the devil has to offer. I mean, that says there's hope for me. There's hope for you. Because, it's, listen, it's not just the prophet, priest, and king anymore that has the, the anointing. Since Jesus died on the cross for us, and he ascended, and sent the, the Father sent the Holy Ghost, now every one of us have the anointing. It's called the priesthood of the believer. It's called that you can operate in the gifts. It's called that you can read the word and understand it for yourself. It's called you can feed yourself and you can operate in spiritual things. You don't have to have somebody else to do it for you. Now, of course, there are special offices and God puts special anointings on people. But you know what? Anything in this word is available to every believer. Every believer that believes, hallelujah. Every believer that responds in faith. That anointing is for you. Then we move over to, to the story about David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. The Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, and at that which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah. And I'm not even going to try that next one, but it does mean this. It means edge of blood. Glory to God, hallelujah. We don't, we're not going to get into talking about the blood tonight, but then let's take a look at this. Verse 4, there went out a champion. Everybody say a champion. 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 This term literally means in the Hebrew, one that stands between two. That causes me to think of the, of the intermediary. It causes me to think of the one who stands in the gap. It causes me to think of the intercessor, but... We know Goliath was not a righteous intercessor. So the devil has some people that he would like to bridge, that the devil would like to use to bridge the gap between you and destruction. Listen to me. Not everything that comes to you with a smile is from God. Not everybody that comes to you with a word, thus saith the Lord, that doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. You've got to judge the spirit behind it. It might be anointed, but it might be anointed from hell, so to speak. He was one that was standing in the gap, but he was standing in the gap for Israel's destruction. He was not bringing the word of truth. He was speaking lies from the father of lies. He was anointed supernaturally with a demonic power, not a righteous power. That's why John said, beloved, try the spirits. In other words, don't believe everybody that comes to you with the thus saith the Lord. Listen, every prophecy is going to be judged. Every word is going to be judged. But that doesn't mean we can't give words. It just means you better know that it comes from the Spirit of God. But the devil, Goliath, was out there in the middle between two to bring destruction. But God was about to bring an anointed young man on the scene that was going to change that. So there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span. That, that is approximately nine foot nine. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now watch this. Everybody knows Shaq, right? Shaquille O'Neal. Seven foot one, 325, 325 pounds. I'll do the preaching, thank you. Yao Ming. Watch this, these people are tall. Sister Joy, these people are tall. Seven foot six, 310 pounds. There was a guy that came here, this was years ago, he was at he was from out of state, was at TCU on a full ride basketball scholarship. He was seven foot tall. When he'd come to your house, he would always clean the refrigerator, the top of the refrigerator, because he could see it looking down. He said, Mark, I didn't realize how tall I was until one night in the middle of the night, I got up and uh, I was a young man, I got up 
in the middle of the night and the fan clipped me right in the middle of the forehead. That was the first time he realized when he would come to a door, watch this, when he would come to a door, he wouldn't just have to tilt his head over, he'd have to do like that or he'd hit his head at the top of the door. Yao Ming, seven foot one, 310 pounds. But as our sister was trying to tell us here just a minute ago, the tallest man in the world, according to the Guinness uh, Book of World Records, was Robert Pershing Wadlow. Check this out, eight foot 11. 490 pounds. His shoe size was a 37 double A. That's 18 and a half feet long. Inches, excuse me. His feet were 18 and a half. Well, we're talking foot. I'm, 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 I'm going to need some help here. Where, where's security? They have left the building. The, the crowd is getting rowdy, especially this group right over here. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. I like to laugh in church. Amen. We need to do something. Laugh, cry, you know, something. But watch this. Let me, let me see. I'm going I'm to get some, uh, I'm going to get a volunteer here. Where's that tape measure? David, you can help me with this. His arm span, we're going to go down here. I know you want behind this pulpit. It's not time. Get out from behind the pulpit. See, this, this group right over here, Bill, keep an eye on them. If they try to rush the stage, okay? His arm span, watch this, his arm span, let me get this right, was nine foot five and three quarter inches. So tell me when we get here. Nine foot five and three quarter inches. Okay, check this out. Arm span. It's not, it's not. Arm span like this. So my arm span. Is that okay? Come up here, buddy. See if you can hook on to my arm span. <laughs> Behind you? This one right over here. See if you can get it done. That was a big arm span. And it, his hand, the measure of his hand from the edge of his palm to the tip of his middle finger, what does that say? One foot, 12 and three quarter inches. That's big. Where's my tape measure? Where's 12 and three quarter inches? Now that 12, 12, 12 inches. You're doing like me, David. See, David, David's got the evangelistic anointing. That would be like the span. Check that out. It's a big guy. Eight foot, 11 inches. 490 pounds. Goliath was nine foot. Thank you, David. You can sit down. Goliath was nine foot nine inches tall. His body armor, not including the helmet of brass, not including anything on his legs, just the coat of mail, just the part that went right here, 126 pounds. That's amazing. That'd be, how'd you like to walk around with one of these teenagers on your back all day long? 126 pounds. His spear, just the head of his spear, weighed 15 or 16 pounds. And when you add the weight of a weaver's beam for the shaft of the spear, his spear weighed approximately 65 pounds. Can you imagine being so big that you could chunk a spear that was 65 pounds? Just think of the length and the weight of his sword. That's big. It is amazing. The giant. There was a reason they called the giant a giant. Now, let's go on because he had something else going on. Verse 10, the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man 
that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those, uh, heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, let, let, me just, let, me just, let me just tell you a little bit of the story because I've got four points that I want to bring out. But you have to understand something. The enemy's fight is always going to be psychological. He is, he was like so much like the devil, Goliath in this case, so much like the devil. Because he's telling David what's going to happen to him. He's prophesying doom and gloom. He's prophesying David's demise before he ever, ever even really steps on the battlefield, so to speak. He's, te he's telling you, he's telling you you're not going to make it. He's telling you you're going to fail. He's going to tell you you're going to turn out like your uncle who went to jail. He's telling you that you're ugly now, but you're going to get uglier. I mean, the, devil's, the devil is full of lies. It's psychological warfare. Why? Because, believer, he already knows that you've won the battle. In Christ, the victory's already been won. Because the devil has been defeated already. He's been stripped of his armor, stripped, laid bare, brought to naught, reduced to nothing. So the devil already knows where he's going. He already knows that. But what he's trying to do is to get you to move off the position that God has given you by grace. So he's prophesying David's doom. He's prophesying, I'm going to feed your carcass to the fowls of the air. But notice this, David didn't flinch. David was not intimidated. David didn't listen to, listen to what the enemy was saying about him because he knew that was a lie anyway. You know, the problem with most counseling situations is people want to come in and tell you for 45 minutes what the devil's doing and what the devil's saying. I don't have time for that. Okay, I don't have time for that. I don't want to listen, I don't want to, listen to things that are demonic. I don't want to listen to anything but faith in the Word of God. Now, I think this is, I think this is an interesting fact. It still holds true after 20 years. I have never personally had to counsel anyone who consistently attends morning prayer over their finances. Never, ever, ever. I've never had anybody in for marriage counseling who consistently attends morning prayer. Now, don't get all under condemnation because morning prayer is not your thing. Okay? There's nothing special about the hour from 6 to 7 o'clock. Okay, so don't be all like, well, he's saying if I don't come to morning prayer, then I'm going to fail. No, you didn't hear that from me. Who are you listening to? I'm just telling you the facts. Okay, I think that points to the fact that people who pray, people who have a relationship with God, may know something that people who don't attend those same meetings. Because what they're doing is they're believing God. They're exercising their faith. They're feeding themselves on the Word of God. They're active in their relationship with God. That's what I'm talking about. So the enemy's battle was psychological. And it's almost like the devil wants you to think that what he's doing is the counterattack. Because he wants, to, he wants to preempt you using your weapons. He wants you to lay down your weapons without a fight because he, know he, he knows he doesn't have a fight left in him if you stand in faith on God's word. You say, well, Mark, sometimes we have challenges. That's true. So do we. You say, Mark, sometimes we actually have to use our faith and pray and believe God for finances. Well, so do we. But you know what? The fact is the overcomer is somebody who overcomes something that was difficult to overcome, and he does it by faith. He's not moved by what the devil's telling him. He's not moved by the nine foot nine inch giant. He's not moved by the fact that the giant's bigger than him, louder than him, more heavenly armored than him. He's not moved by what he sees. He's moved by God's word. That's faith. But what Israel was doing is what most believers do. 
They allow the enemy to set the terms of the fight. David didn't do that. David had some prophecies of his own. David began to say, look, I'm not just going to take you out, but I'm going to feed the carcasses of your army. Not just you, big boy, but everybody that's with you is going down because I'm not coming to you with just a sling and a stone. I am coming to you in the name of the God Most High. I'm coming to you, we would say, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, the name that has all power behind it, the name that releases the power of God. So David's prophecy was bigger. Goliath is looking down on David. David is looking above the hills from whence cometh his help. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. I'm telling you something, saints. Don't let Goliath tell you where you're going to fight the battle and how the terms of the battle are going to be fought. You're the one with the authority. You're the one that's in command. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations... And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm telling you, here's the battlefield right here. That's where you win or lose right here. Let me tell you, we are more than what we seem. We have a treasure in earth and vessels. It's what's in us that makes the difference. It's what's in you that makes the difference. Listen, you don't have some second-rate Holy Ghost. You don't have less Holy Ghost than the apostles did, than Smith Wigglesworth did. You don't have less of a Holy Ghost. you got the same Holy Ghost. Goliath had a sword and a spear, but David's weapons were mightier than these. Our weapons are not of this world. Casting down imaginations, the thoughts. See, the devil wants you to think you've lost before the battle even begins. Learn to interrupt those thoughts that you know are not coming from God. Don't let those thoughts play over and over in your mind. Don't let, the, don't let the enemy show you a video of your demise. Don't sit there for 15 minutes or three days listening to his trash and letting him show you a PowerPoint presentation of all the terrible things that are going to happen to you. Contradict him. Well, my mama told me never to inter- interrupt anybody. Interrupt him. Speak the word contradict what the enemy says, not two days from now, right now. Take every thought. Somebody say every thought. Take every thought captive. Mm -mm -mm. Now look, look at this. Verse 48, it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. I want you to notice something. This is very important. I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army. He didn't run towards, he didn't run towards Goliath. He had a bigger prize in mind. Are you, are you getting this? Are you getting me? Help me out here. Might have something to do with only eight of you being in the middle section. You try preaching sometime where everybody's at the periphery. Okay? I'll preach to you. Give me some eye contact here. Are you getting that? David had his eyes on a bigger prize. He was not going after Goliath. Can you get a hold of that? 
He was not going after Goliath. He was going after the whole army. That is, a, that is what a man with faith in God will do. He's got the bigger picture in mind. He knows there's something beyond what I'm facing today. And he's not just planning on winning today. He's planning on going for the whole enchilada. Are you listening to me? He's going for the whole Megillah. He's going to take not only what the devil's got in front of him, but he's going to take down everything that's connected to that. Why? Because his family's at stake. His future's at stake. He's not just going to win in one arena. He's going to go the distance. He's going to make sure that he makes Goliath pay. Be like that, that girl that used to be in our, in our college and career Bible study. We had her preach one night. And she preached about take it back and make it hurt. It wasn't just enough to take back what the enemy stole from, from you, but you had to make him hurt. You had to make him pay. In other words, I'm not just going to go saying, thank you, Mr. Devil, I'm taking back what. No, I'm taking everything, not just what you stole. I'm taking everything you stole from my family. I'm taking everything you stole from my neighbors. I'm going to take it back and I'm going to make it hurt. You're going to be sorry that you ever messed with me. Glory to God. The giant was a temporary hurdle. Temporary obstacle. So we know what happens. Here goes the slang. Nine foot nine, David, teenager, ruddy, cute. <laughs> Boom, there goes Goliath. Now the prophecy's coming to pass. The prophecy's coming on the, if they, it, listen, if Goliath had been smart, he would have been running. Okay, I don't know how fast a guy that weighs 500 pounds can run, but he would have been running. If, if he just knew that that was his last day, he wouldn't, have been, he wouldn't have been talking so brave. But David let the sling go. I'm telling you, this is where preparation meets anointing. There's a God part and there's a you part. You be faithful. You be faithful to prepare, and in your day, you'll be more than enough when God adds his super to your natural. So here it goes. Shh, bam, there goes the giant. Here, can you imagine the thud? 500 pounds. You drop 500 pounds nine foot off the ground. Boom. You know, that was so supernatural. You ever see anybody get clotheslined on the football field? Their feet come out from under them and they're like, whoop, this. Boom. 500 pounds. David wanted to make sure that he didn't get too close at that point. Shh, bam. And then get this. The scripture says there was no sword in David's hand. Why? He didn't have one. Never needed one before. When he slew the lion and the bear, he did it barehanded. Listen, when the anointing of God comes on you, you are not ordinary. You are not an ordinary person because it's not just you, it's God coming through you. That's why you can know what you could not know. That's why you can say what you couldn't say before because it's not just you, it's God coming through you. Church, when we get a hold of this, we're going to return to the days of signs and wonders because it's his spirit in you that wants to move through you. He grabbed the, he grabbed the lion by the beard and smote him. David had no sword. Now, Alfred Bar Al Al Albert Barnes believes like I believe concerning the lion and the bear. That it's quite possible because of the way the wording of the scripture is that the lion and the bear was one attack. You know what I'm talking about? The lion and the bear. You, you're looking at me like, Mark, you are crazy. Let me read it to you. If you don't believe me, let me just show you. David, we're going to have to back up, but I'll do it. Chapter 17, verse 32, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, he's about to discount him. He doesn't believe him. 
Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine. Now, this is bad, folks. When God's people start telling you, you can't make it. David needed to find another pastor at this point. Get a man of faith. Thou art not able to go against the Philistine. That's the same thing the Philistine was saying. Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. See, that's exactly what Jesse thought. Thou art but a youth. He's the youngest. He's a sheep herder. Thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear. Are you listening to me? Look, keep your finger there. Let me just tell you this. Whether you believe that or not, whether it's true or not, the fact is, if that happened, it was demonic. It was supernatural. But the anointing was on, on David. He said, there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. He's presenting this as one story. The possibility exists. At least Mike and I believe it that way, and we're in some pretty good company. And took a lamb out of the flock, and I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of the mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Oh, my. Now, here are my four points. Yeah, four points. Number one, God is not limited. God is not limited. He is the limitless, boundless, almighty God who is bigger than the universe that he created. He's transcendent. He's imminent. He's big, but he's close and personal. Israel, listen... Israel could have stormed the Philistine army and blown right by Goliath. I'm talking to you about not letting the devil set the terms for your fight. They stood there and really they, they were cowering. They were hiding behind the rocks when David first shows up. All because the devil is telling them you send out one man. Listen, you're in trouble when you start listening to the devil. Now, God's more than enough to meet any challenge, but you know what? We're going to set the terms of the battle based on what does God's word say. But they were listening to the devil. He was setting the pace for this thing. That's the thing that I, I'm troubled about. When people start letting the devil set the pace... Well, I tried that, but it's not working. Says who? Says who that it's not working? Oh, ye of little faith. It's not working. Says who, carnal-minded man? It's not working. Where is that written? See, I've been, I, I've, been, I've been given all my life, but I'm not prospering. Says who? Hello? I've got a pain in my body, so I'm not healed. Oh, yes, says who? My Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, you're healed. I'm not letting the devil set the terms for my warfare. If they'd have wanted to, they could have done what they had done for years, for centuries. They could have arrayed the battle, lined up on both sides, stood and looked at each other across that valley for a day, for an hour, and blown, so to speak, the charge, and then got down there and got after it. You mean to tell me 40,000 Jews or whatever it was in the army that day, here you got one nine-foot man with maybe a 10, 11-foot arm span. Man, if you're all running, if all 40,000 or 100,000 of you are running, you could just run right past that sucker and just stay out of his zone and just, you, listen, they would, have been, they would have been smiting the Philistines 
all the way back to Shoko before that guy could turn around and get his lumber and body moving. Are you listening to me? But what they did was they let the devil set the term for their battle. They had the name of God. They had the army of God. Listen, the, the, the army of Israel, while they were obeying the commands of God, never, ever lost a battle. While they kept the terms of the covenant, they never lost a man in battle. And so here they are listening to the devil telling them that he's going to feed one man, that he's going to feed their carcasses to the birds of the air. Well, you know what all they had to do was look back and say, you know what, God delivered us here. And God did this for us. And we faced that battle. And we faced that battle. And look what God has done. We have a covenant. That's what David did. He said this uncircumcised Philistine, this guy who has no covenant with God, this guy who's serving the devil, our God is able to deliver us. Our God is able to see to it. And he's, David was like this. His faith was so big. He said, if none of y'all go with me, I can take care of it myself. Because the least in the kingdom of God, with the anointing of God on him, is greater than the greatest that the enemy has to offer. Come on, somebody praise God. God is not limited. He's not limited to our way of doing things. He's not limited to what we know. He is infinite in power. Listen, God had to interject somebody from outside the system to get this battle won. Have you noticed this? Because the army was letting the devil set the terms for the battle, he had to interject somebody from outside of the battle. You know what? God will do whatever it takes to help you win. Yeah, I said he'll do whatever it takes to help you win. It was somebody that nobody thought was ready. David's dad, he's too young. Saul, you're too young. Your enemy's too experienced. Eliab, you're naughty. You haven't acted right. That's what his brother said. The enemy, what are you, what are you sending out here? Are you listening to me? Everybody discounted David. Samuel thought everyone else was the one. This is the seer, the man of God. Jesse didn't even call David to the meeting. Saul said, you're too young and your enemy's too big. Eliab, the eldest, discounted him. The giant mocked him, but God had chosen him. Then I like this. David didn't fit the armor. He didn't fit the mold. They thought the armor was too big for David, but really David was too big for the armor. I like that. Boy, that made me smile. They thought that's an original. From the Holy Ghost. They thought the armor was too big for David. See, I'm going to say it again. Thank you. You redeemed yourself after the giant thing. They thought the armor was too big for David. But David was too big for the armor. I like that. Mm -mm -mm. Too young, not enough experience, not enough training. Come on, how many times have you in some way been told that you're not enough, that you don't measure up, you're not good enough, you're second rate, second class, if only you'd come earlier, if only you'd stayed later. Hello? Unfortunately, for most Christians, the devil doesn't even have to get on that because we take care of that ourselves. Uh-huh. Because if the devil, listen, if the devil discounts you, that's one thing. But when you start discounting yourself, that's another thing. That's something David did not do. Because his confidence was not in himself. His confidence was in God. Listen, David had some training that nobody else knew about. Are you listening to me? David had been to Holy Ghost University. Hello? He had a PhD in praise and worship with a minor in slingshot.
Point number two, God does not judge by externals. The Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. The prophet Jeremiah disqualified himself. He said, "Oh Lord God, I cannot speak for I'm a child. And the Lord said unto him, say not that you're a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. The people in Jesus' town disqualified him. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Why? Because they tend to discount you because they look at you after the flesh. Scripture says in Matthew 13, 58, that Jesus did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Didn't say he could not. It said he did not. Are right, you listening to me? Didn't say he could not. It said he did not. He did not honor unbelief. David was unqualified in the world's eyes, but not disqualified in God's eyes. Listen, never underestimate, never underestimate a vessel yielded to God. Whether they're young, they're old, male, female, it does not matter. Anything yielded to God is going to be inhabited by something that's greater than this natural realm. You ever notice that God has a habit of taking your not enough and making it more than enough? That's the anointing. That's the purpose of the anointing. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Number three, God is your help and strength. God is your help and your strength. I said God is your help and your strength. God is your help and your strength. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles 20, verse 15. The battle is not yours, but God's. Psalms 57, 3 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. You know what? David's just being honest, isn't he? He's saying, you know what? Whenever I am afraid, I'm going to trust in God. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. You know what, folks? Think about this for a second. Watch yourself. Check your words. Check your actions to see how many things that you're doing out of fear. A fear motivation. Parents, watch how you parent, that you don't parent in fear. Instead of having faith in God, a lot of times we're having fear in what the enemy might do. Listen, I'm not going to allow the devil to set the terms for my prayer life. All right, listen to me. Perk up. I'm almost finished. You've, you've just about made this Wednesday night. But are you listening to me? A lot of people have their prayer life directed by the enemy. The enemy's sitting back sipping Kool-Aid, and you're over here going on your merry way, and he throws a thought at you. He says, hey, I'm taking your kids, and you ain't getting them back. And so we go to prayer over what the enemy just said. Listen, the way to preempt the enemy is to do what you do by the Spirit of God. All right, listen to me. Otherwise, we're praying reactionary prayers. The devil threatens this, so we're praying over here. Meanwhile, he's doing the sneak attack around the back. Do you know what? We need to allow heaven to dictate where our prayers go. 
And then we'll, the Holy Spirit will see to it that we cut off every place that the enemy could come in. Then it's supernatural. It's not fear-based. It's not, well, I'm going to wear myself out trying to think, okay, did I pray for this today? Did I pray about that today? We're going to, be, we're going to allow the Spirit of God to lead us so that we're praying things by the Spirit. God is your help and your strength. Paul said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. You know what? There was no one there to help David with the lion and the bear. But God. But God. The sheep needed help. There was no one else there. So David said, I'll step up. And you know what? When he did, the anointing was on him. Listen, look, look at me for just a second, group. I'm, I'm almost finished. You may be finished. But listen to me for just a second. The anointing that God put on you works on demand. You have to yield to it. Just like you can yield to speaking in tongues, you have to yield to the anointing in every other area of your life. There's a whole lot of you out there thinking, well, you know what? Mark's been talking about these gifts of the Spirit and stirring us up and talking about tongues, interpretation of tongues, words of wisdom, words of knowledge. But you know what? I believe that. And I believe that part about being divided to every man or every person severally as God wills. But I don't know how to, I don't know how to cooperate with that. Well, that's the whole point. You have to cooperate with it. The anointing works on demand. If you want to see some miracles, if you want to see some healings, then you need to lay hands on some sick. Are you listening to me? Why? Because even though that anointing was on David, he had to go down to that brook and he had to pick out some stones and he had to run to the enemy. There's a you part and a God part. Psalm 73, 26, David said, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Number four, everybody say number four. God is eternal. Your battle is not. No trial ever lasts forever. No trial ever lasts forever. It's temporary. That means there's an end. And if you've already begun, that means you're closer to the end than before. Goliaths can look undefeatable, but they're not. With God, nothing is impossible. Let me give you two more scriptures, maybe three. 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always means always. 1 John 5, 4, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory, even our faith. 2 Chronicles 20, 15, we've talked about it earlier. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Listen, believer. You set the terms for the battle based on God's word. When the enemy starts talking, you listen to me, when the enemy starts talking, you need to rise up and contradict what the enemy's saying. You don't have to listen to that. You can, listen, you can take every thought captive. The anointing is resident on you, in you, and is moving here to move through you. But you've got to yield. You've got to respond. Jesus has had us in training here in this church for a long time to make us sensitive to the moving of God's Spirit and sensitive to His presence. Well, when His anointing comes, it comes for a purpose. And whether your purpose is ever to speak anything in this room or not, the anointing that comes on you here, the anointing that abides in you more accurately, is going to at some time stir up in you. You're going to come into, you're going to come around somebody that just stirs up in you, the compassion stirs up in you, and you're going to find yourself speaking words. You don't have to shake, spit, declare, thus saith the Lord, but God will give you a word. If you'll give it to him, it'll carry an anointing. Just like David's stone 
There was something going on there that was bigger than the physical picture of just him being there. It was the anointing of God that was on him that caused his weapon to be effective because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Father, we thank you tonight that there is an anointing that's present in each one of our lives to tear down the works of the devil right here in Fort Worth, Texas and wherever we go to break up nests of demons in the shop where we work. When we go to the family reunion, we can lay hands on the sick. Father, I thank you that there is a, an anointing for every believer. And I thank you as we respond to that anointing that supernatural things take place.